So, as Gregor Mendel, the now the father of modern genetics, but at the time just beginning his work out of curiosity and making keen observations, and one of those observations he noticed were distinct characteristics in the traits of his peas. They were not blending, they were either or. And so, remember, blending was a very common idea at the time. This either or notion was particulate theory, not blending theory. And he was seeing traits like this, traits like tall pea plants and short or dwarf pea plants, purple flowers on the plants or white flowers on the plants, but nowhere in between purple and white. There were yellow peas produced, as seeds, but also green peas produced, and those peas might be round, or they might be dimpled or wrinkled, or, you know, there are many ways I've heard this described, as, you know, round, it's smooth versus not smooth. But all of these traits were seen in the garden, and after a few years, he noticed that he was able to breed plants that he called true breeding. They bred true. We now think of that as purebred. We also have other names for it that I'll discuss in a bit, but this is the plants that every generation, if you allow them to self-pollinate, they're going to look exactly the same. Their offspring are not clones, but they appear to be clones. All the physical characteristics that he was looking at were the same, generation after generation after generation. So he could count on those characteristics to breed true. So his question involved cross-pollination. He took many pure breeding plants that had opposite traits, such as the white and the purple flowers, and he would cross-pollinate them instead of allowing them to self-pollinate. He took a lot of precautions. He would actually use a paintbrush to remove the pollen from one flower and transfer it to the other, and then he would take pollen from that plant and transfer it back. So it was a cross. Both plants were getting the pollen from the other plant. And then you could remove the pollen producing parts of the plant to ensure that they would not ever self-pollinate. So not only did this help to teach us a lot about heredity, it also dispelled this notion that one, only one gender contributed to the characteristics of the offspring, that both parents were contributing in equal ways, could come from his experiments and did because of the way he cross-pollinated, that it was, you know, both purple to white and white to purple. So let's look at what this was like, what he saw with peas. So if you're looking at pea color, which was very clearly yellow or green, he had some pure breeding yellow pea plants and some pure breeding green pea plants. He cross-pollinated them. And the next generation, so, you know, those flowers were cross-pollinated. They produced seeds, and those seeds were the next generation of offspring, and all of the seeds were yellow. All of them. There was no blending. That generation was called the F1, or first filial generation. He then waited maybe a year. You know, you have to, growing seasons take time. So he labeled all these yellow peas very carefully, waited until the next season, planted them again, let them grow up and self-pollinate so they cross they, they were crossed with themselves, basically. And lo and behold, the green appeared again. In the F2 generation, there were yellow and green peas, and they were present in a 3 to 1 ratio. To be exact, it was, he counted thousands of peas. It was 6,022 yellow peas and 2,001 green peas. This was, I know this doesn't seem like much to us, but this was amazing to him. The fact that a trait could disappear and not blend and then come back was very, very supportive of the particulate theory. And he saw this in many traits, the flowers, the height of the plants, the pea color, the pea texture. He was seeing it over and over and over again. And based on his observations, he came up with some terms that we still use today. The first one is recessive, and that's the trait that is masked 
by the dominant trait or disappears. The dominant trait is the one that remains visible in every generation. And then you have the fact that it wasn't blending, that it was the interaction of a set of particles. Today we call those particles genes, and we know that there are various forms of a gene. We call them alleles. Often there are dominant and recessive alleles. We do have more complex notions of this now because sometimes genes have three or four different alleles, not just a single dominant and recessive allele, but we'll talk more about that in the next lesson. But one thing that's important to note here is that because you get two, that you can be homozygous, where you have two of the same version of the allele, like two dominant alleles or two recessive alleles, which we show with capital and lowercase letters, another thing that Gregor Mendel got us started on, these capital and lowercase letters, or traits for a trait we can be, because we get two copies, heterozygous which means you get two different copies. So in this case, with simple dominant and recessive inheritance, you would have a capital letter A and a lowercase letter A. You would have two different copies that you inherited from each of your parents, one from each parent. So we always have two, two copies of every gene. He continued looking at this, verifying his results. He saw tall and short pure breeding plants crossed them, found that they were all tall. We know now that that was because they were heterozygous, taking a dominant allele from the tall plant and a recessive allele from the short plant. And in the F2 generation, they would be 3 to 1, tall to short. And again, he counted all of these. We have his records, and we know that there were 787 tall plants and 277 dwarf plants. And not only was he doing all this painstaking record keeping and counting, he would actually take these dwarfs because they would have died probably from the shade of the tall plants. He would actually take them all out of their little plots in the garden and move them to their own dwarf plant area so that they had plenty of sunlight and everything was as equal as possible in this experiment. He did a very good job of controlling every variable that he could. It's, it's, it's amazing, um, the data that we have from his records. And as he kept these records, he used the capital and lowercase letters we still use now, capital for the dominant factor or particle, which we now call alleles, lowercase for the recessive one. So we now call the Double dominant, we would say is homozygous dominant. We have heterozygous, a dominant and a recessive. Homozygous recessive means the offspring inherited two recessive alleles. These are known as their genotypes. Genotypes are the genetic makeup of the organism. Mendel didn't know there were genes, and yet he was already figuring out that there was some factor and individuals got two of them from their parents. What he could see was the phenotype that the two dominant containing sets, so the homozygous dominant and heterozygous genotypes, appeared yellow, and that the homozygous recessive appeared green or short. And so that was phenotype, and that's the physical traits of the organism. And just to talk a little bit more about his terminology, he would have called the homozygous dominant and the homozygous recessive the pure breeding plants or the true breeding plants, and these heterozygous plants would have been called hybrids. All he was studying really were plant hybrids. It's, it's, I'm so amazed because we have so much information from him, and he really was seeking to grow better plants. I mean, that's how all of this started, although I'm sure right away he... He started to analyze his results and, and get a hint that this was more than that. 